Hi, welcome to Rockdown. I'm Wendy Stapleton. Well, cast your mind back to the early 60s, where the scene was dominated by jazz clubs and coffee shops. Hmm. Someone was about to change all of that. He opened Australia's first rock club. Where did this idea come from? We're about to find out. Would you please welcome Mr. Gary Spry. Thanks, Wendy. First nightclub. There you go. And not the only, not the only, one of the many nightclubs that you were about to open up. Yeah, I've had about 13 of them. Gary, um, you grew up in Melbourne. That's correct, yeah. Melbourne grammar boy. Yes. And uh, excelled in athletics. Actually, I sort of thought that you might have been in showbiz, or oh, the family was in showbiz, but in actual fact, you were an athletic superstar. I, was a, I, was a, <laughs> I don't know about that. I went to school for sport, and I excelled in athletics and swimming and football. And then I got the scholarship to go overseas to a university in America. So I thought this would be great. I left and went on a, did a course over there on business administration and management. And obviously, while you were over there checking out um, the nightclub scene. Well, there was a lot of, yeah, like every night it seemed we went out to a different club, which they had there in, all over America, in San Francisco, LA, there was little clubs all around the place. Not to the size that they are today, but they still had plenty of live places. You could go and see Trini Lopez or you could go and see the, the Kingston Trio and accent and things like that that were appearing just around the corner from where you lived. And I decided I wanted to go back to Melbourne. And um, it was like a hick town. It was nothing. There what, was year? what year did you get back? What year was that? The early 60s? 62. And so you got I back started, here and there was nothing? Well, there was nothing to go out with. And on the north of the Yarra, there was a lot of 60-40 dancers. Now, that's 60% 60 ballroom and 40% yeah. 50s rock and roll. Why was it only that side of the Yarra? Because that was the rockers' side of the Yarra. The jazzers were on the south. <laughs> OK, and so they frequented... <laughs> they were on the other the side. The coffee shops and, and the... Yeah, on the south side of, you know, over in, on the other south side of the Yarra, there were... Mainly jazz dancers, all jazz dancers, all the churches, all the halls, they all had jazz dancers. And coffee lounges with folk singers. And I decided I wanted to go and open a rock club, which... And a rock club was as opposed to a nightclub? Well, there's been nightclubs in Melbourne and mainly in Sydney, but a few in Melbourne, which is the old-fashioned cotton lounge type nightclub where you sit down and the lamp on the table and they had a jazz band playing and dancers came out. Bill you know, the, the old-fashioned yeah, yeah. And um, my parents and all that went to those times. But this is a proper rock and roll club, you know, with a band and floor shows that were singers like we know today. So we bought this place in, uh, in Turek Village and it was called um, Pinocchio. We called it Pinocchio. It wasn't called Pinocchio. It was Louis's Restaurant. And... Uh, I was going to put the Seekers on it. They were going to open the show, which I'm glad in a way they, they weren't because uh, people would have perceived the music to be kind of folk singing. So they had just got a, a trip to England and they couldn't do the opening. So I went down to Moomba and uh, they had this Battle of the Bands competition for the band most like the Beatles. You've got to remember the Beatles hadn't come to Australia. Australia, yeah. This is 1964. They came in June and this is February of 1964. And there was this band called The Flies that won the competition. They were the first long-haired band in Australia. Ronnie Burns was the lead singer of that band. And uh, I booked them to be the resident band. Ronnie Burns and The Flies? Yeah, well, it's called, called The Flies. called The Flies, yeah. Later on, Ronnie Burns left and solo. had a solo career. And we used to run two floor shows a night. And we had people like Olivia, Pat Carroll, and acts like that that the were BGs. around. BGs, oh, we had nearly every act that came down was, they all wanted to do Pinocchio. Just imagine you've got the only nightclub in Melbourne today. Well, everyone would want to be there. <laughs> the, queue, the queue out the front was 100 yards down the road every single night. And uh, it was very popular. I had no opposition for nearly 18 months until the garrison opened in uh, High, High Street. Street. Yeah. And then after that, a few months after that, the Thumping Tum and Sebastian's and and did you have anything to do with them or just the fact that other no, people... No, they all that saw all how well I was idea. doing and they said, oh, well, this looks like a good racket. This looks like a great Let's racket. Let's go and start one. 
So, you know, it spawned a lot of other nightclubs. It's one little club, Pinocchio's, helped spawn a lot of artists because people wanted to play there, so I brought them all the way from Adelaide and all the way from Perth, and they all wanted to come to Melbourne. And the, the amazing thing is, Melbourne didn't have a musical scene at all. There was no recording studios, there was no recording companies, there was no TV shows, there was no rock clubs, and there was no kind of magazines or anything to do with music. And this is, the world's music was changing. The Beatles and the Mercy Beat were replacing the American rock and roll from yeah. the 50s. Yeah. So with the start of Pinocchio's and the success of it, Bill Armstrong, who was on the show before, he opened the first professional eight-track recording studio. All the ones in Sydney were four-track recording studios. So he opened the first professional, world-class recording studio. So they, they had their rock club, which was Pinocchio. They then had, in the same the year, recording Bill studio. Armstrong. The Go Show started in Melbourne the same year. And so they had a vehicle where Buddy England and all these acts and people that were around in those days could be exposed. Because the only TV shows were in Sydney, um, Six O'Clock Rock and Bandstand, Bandstand and things like that, Sing Sing Sing, and nothing in Melbourne. So with the advent of the Go Show, we had that. And then Go Set came out as a magazine, a rock magazine. Yes, it did, of course. Which Molly Meldrum was a writer for. Now, was Molly um, on the Go Show? I, I remember him being on one of... What was the show? Where no, everyone used to mime the records. That was... <laughs> was that commotion? That was commotion. It was fantastic. Ian Turpey was the compare of uh, the Go Show, the original one, and after he left... Um, I'm trying to think who was the, who took his place. But, no, Molly actually got a, a job as a mimer on commotion, which Ken Sparks compared. OK. And half the customers, that, or more than that, all the mimers on that show, commotion, were from Pinocchio's. They were my customers. And they all put their hand up and said, yeah, I want to... I want to be in yeah, it. Yeah, and I they were all in it. it. They were all my customers. So you also started to manage people. Well, was it you, that early, early then? You've got a little bit of power when you've got the only nightclub in <laughs> Melbourne. And they all come down and say, listen, I, I want to work. So what happened was I was managing the flies and I picked up other people like April Byron, who was a very good singer in those days. And... And then uh, I toured the flies around Australia, and when they were in Adelaide, there was a support band that was supporting them on it there. They just blew them off the stage. They were the most amazing band. Who was and it? And my roadie is ringing me up, and he's saying, you've got to get over here. This band is the most unbelievable band I've ever seen. So I went over there, and I saw this band, and immediately brought them to Melbourne for three months' work. Who was it? It's the Twilights. <laughs> The Glenn, Twilights, Glenn, Glenn Shorrick. And the, Twilight. and the Twilights and the Easy Beats were the most successful and most popular bands of the 60s, by far. Head and shoulders Head and above, shoulders above the rest. Band. We'll take a short break and be back soon with Gary Spry. Rock down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My guest tonight is Gary Spry, a nightclub entrepreneur extraordinaire, entrepreneur. manager... Manager, everything. promoter. Where were we? I mean, I think you were just talking about the, just the amount about of people, Pinocchios. Pinocchios. Um, so that those four things—that's the club, the TV show, the, the go show, the magazine go set, Bill Armstrong Studios—they actually brought everyone from around Australia over here. You know, bands from Perth and bands from. Uh, lots of bands from uh, South Australia and bands from the thing. The only ones, I only got a few from Sydney because they were jealously holding on to their, where the music scene of uh, Australia. And it was a different scene as well, wasn't it? It was more like the, with the RSLs and all the big clubs up there. They had well, they did. Much like they the had Las their Vegas uh, Leeds sort of clubs and yeah. poker machines and all that. Melbourne but was that rock and roll. But that wasn't the environment you needed to do rock acts in. That's right. So we had the perfect environment by dancers like Opus and all that to change from the jazz to go straight out and have bands like The Loved Ones and all Masters Apprentices and bands like the that. The Groove. The Groove and all things like suit. that. Suit. The Suit. Think Pink. Think Pink. The, the what a great marketing thing yeah, though, that was. was. was I mean, it was, it was fabulous. That, that was um, Jeff Joseph, was it, that and, managed? Uh, Jeff Joseph and uh, Daryl Sambal. Daryl Sambal. Who was John Farnham's original manager. They both co-managed 
suit. So then, you know, with the, the, the Twilights, which I took under on my wing and managed, and they were by far the most successful, we toured Australia with the Easy Beats and the Twilights were... And then the Easy Beats went overseas, the Bee Gees went overseas, and the Twilights won the first Toadley's Battle of the Sounds, national, it's a Battle of the Sounds, so they got a free trip to England. So I left with them and we went to England for about seven or eight months and recorded in Abbey Road and worked for an agency over there called uh, The Great Organisation. So when we came back from England, um, I picked up two ideas from England that I wanted to start. One was to make the music scene in Melbourne professional. Before we ever had an agency, everyone used to work from home, all their, their offices, wherever yeah, they worked. Yeah, just wherever. And there was no full-time entertainment agency. So when I came back, I formed this thing called AMBO, which is Australian Management and Booking Organisation. I remember AMBO. And it became the biggest entertainment agency in the country, with 75% of the artists in Australia all working through AMBO. The way it worked was that you had all the leading managers with their offices in the same building. Where was it? As a, it's um, opposite Chevron in Commercial Road, and it was in the same building as the American Consulate. Oh, OK. Which is not there now, but um, it's a medical centre now. But uh, it was in a good position and it had a central agency that booked all the bands. And we had every act. We had every major band just about, with the exception of about half So you virtually band. had no competition here? Well, the Musicians Union and the Actors' Equity tried to bar us. And they said, it's a monopoly, we don't want it, you know. And we said, well, when, you, when a band is owed money, do you go out and get this $400 that they owe? Or do you just write to the people and say, you're a naughty boy, we're not going to let you have some bands? Thank you. That's we exactly can just, by saying. power, we just say, well, you don't get Normie Ray, you don't get Ronnie Burns, you don't get Johnny Farnham. Until you, go you pay. The group. You don't get anyone, it's any good, unless you pay that account. Oh, Good on you. So everyone paid and everyone and we never had any problem getting their money. So that was the first full time ever professional entertainment agency. Was it was it what Psych Harbour there? Premier today? That's right. Yeah. It, but it was the forerunner to that. To to that. When you were at the offices there and you looked over the road at the Chevron, yeah. was this where you started to look at the building lovingly because <laughs> of course you went on to then open distillery that's right and then a few years later in the same building but literally around the corner yeah, it was babes babes at the chevron that's right but it, it, at the time when we had our offices there it was um called the celebrity room and then when i came back from england uh, they just opened it up and called the distillery and the manager got sick and then they rang me up and said, we want you to run the room. So next four years I was running the distillery and the, it, was a, it was the last of the sit down nightclubs where you had to have a chair. There was no stand up bars, but they had fabulous floor shows and they had fabulous bands on and it. It's like the old traditional nightclub more so than the modern ones today. And then we decided that we'd open up one called Babes at the front of the St Kilda Road end of it. And that was the first of the modern nightclubs. I know because I was in. Dance I was in the course. first first band that worked there. You were. And and speaking of a band of called the, Sold Out. I don't know. Um, oh, yes, very funny. Um, it was a great gig. It was um, five, six nights a week. Yeah, six nights a week. And I remember we. The played. only night that we didn't have any, it was a Monday night. Where it was a night called Chaps which was a gay night, so I don't think you were singing there. <laughs> but it was called Chaps on Monday night. That's right, they used to get about 800 people. It was wonderful. And it was the first actual gay night in Melbourne, you know, that they had. But even, um, even Babes really was the first actual disco sort of idea Yeah, it was the first one with all well your modern was, dance yeah. floor and flashy lights and... DJ. The black DJ band. you had and all soul music and... And also you started managing bands. And I have to pull this No, up. I was always managing bands. I had this. You're going to bring this out in a minute. But Does everyone remember a band? Anyone remember a band called Mother Goots? Yes. <laughs> have a look at that with Gary in the middle. They, it's I'm too good. great one. They were all crazy. <laughs> well, that's debatable. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they um, well, so I was running Babes at the nightclub. 
Uh, Ivan Damon rang me up from Queensland. He said, look, I've got this band that's arrived over from New Zealand. They need a manager. And I went, oh, I'm not interested, you know. But he flew me up there and I saw this band. I just couldn't believe it. They were the most mind-boggling band I've ever seen in my life. There must have been something in the water in New Zealand at the time because if you think about it, there was this band and there were split ends. <laughs> and you couldn't get two more bizarre looking bands in no, your life, could you? Were, but they, I think Mother Goose was a step, <laughs> step more bizarre than, than split well, ends because they absolutely. actually, when people watched them perform, their reaction was, they, they just mouth dropped. That's unbelievable. So you went on from the Chevron I had this idea to do this first upmarket super rock club. And that's when I went down and designed and worked really hard to make Billboard in concert. And it's still there? Well, people said it wouldn't work because they reckon rock and roll is grungy and disco is all, you know, lights and coloured silver paper and, you know, like that. And because I did an upmarket place, they said, oh, no, they'll never go there. Too, too nice for the people in rock and roll. Well, they loved it. They loved it. We packed every night. There were just 1,500, 2,000 people there most nights, even on a Monday night. But it's still going. It's still going, yeah. Rock Down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My guest is Gary Spry. Now, Gary, uh, you are so busy, always either opening a club or managing a new act. Mm. But at the moment, I know that there's been a big push for uh, an Australian Hall of Fame. Right. And I know that you've been talking with Molly, Molly Meldrum, yeah. Ian, and several other people in the Australian music industry. Well, Michael Kodinsky and Molly have been talking about it. Yeah. Um, and they think it should be in Melbourne because it is the capital of the music business in Australia, as much as Sydney doesn't like it. But, yes. Uh, you're going to cause a lot of trouble for us. <laughs> and if you think of that's where all the artists come from, and it's an appropriate place to have it in Melbourne. Yep. And it's just got to find a, a, a venue. A venue. Which um, can be commercially viable for people to go there, you know, somewhere around Federation Square or somewhere like that. That's easy and accessible to the public. And Support Act, which I'm on the events committee of, is a... Just explain what Support Act is. Support Act is the benevolent fund for musicians and entertainers. Uh, if they're out of work or they're sick or they've come on hard times, then we support them. It's, it's like the variety club is to TV. That, to TV, what that's What it right. is to the music industry is Support Act. The Support Act is wonderful and, um, of course, most, most of our um, entrepreneurs these days and promoters, usually you'll find it at venues when you go into the big concerts there's a, a donation table yeah, or no, a percentage of the ticket sales might well for years no one's looked after us go to musicians and entertainers that have fallen on hard time that's right that you're yeah. also writing a book yes i've uh, about a third of the way through writing a book on the history of uh nightclubs and rock clubs in melbourne the top 50 uh, so there's covers from two covers from um, 1964 right through to 2004. It's a big thing because you've got to get photographs of all these clubs and the, particularly the ones in the 60s like the Catcher and the Thumping Tum which I've already done. I've already written up 18 of the clubs already. So, you know, if no one wrote about it, it would be lost. It can go in the Hall of Fame. Well, home. it's part of Melbourne's culture. It's Melbourne's history. got more nightclubs, more bars and more clubs than any city in the world. Any. That's New York, Paris, London. Per population, we've got more than any other city. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> because we've got more drunks. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, just quickly, I know because we've got a wrap. Please tell us about this gorgeous Kim. We just made a record of her, and this is her name. This is Kim Deneray. And, uh, and she's gorgeous. The songs were written by Terry Britton, who is, uh, you probably don't know, but he was the lead guitarist with the Twilights and he wrote songs for Tina Turner like What's Love Got To Do With It, uh, We Don't Need Another Hero, Olivia, Private Dancer, yeah, yeah and Olivia, Cliff Richard, Devil Woman. He's amazing, like amazing writer. So he wrote these three songs for Kim and we've just finished recording them and they've turned out great. Well good luck to you and good luck to Kim and thanks Gary so much for coming on today. Thank, Thank you for being here.